Good morning. It's the 29th of November. Only a few more webinars to go, Stuart, before we uh, we take a break before Christmas. And today we've got two topics. One is uh, on one of the uh, ASX's uh, most followed chip stocks. But let's start off, Stuart, and this is a, a topic that is close to my heart because I'm from Amsterdam. Let's start. Let's kick it off with uh, cannabis 4.0. So, medicinal, Mark. Medicinal ah, I know. I'll, uh, let's skip. Let's go straight to brain chip then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've um, I've just been uh, doing a webinar with uh, uh, some friends of ours over in New Zealand. Um, those of us uh, who those of you who follow our um, sister company uh, Pitt Street Research will know that we were commissioned by uh, Canna South, uh, NZX CBD, uh, to write some research on them a little while ago, and I just appeared on a. A webinar that they did for the benefit of their uh, their investor group. Uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that they'll make that available, so you can see some of my uh, comments on Canna South as well as the the industry generally. But that's prompted me to revisit um, uh, cannabis uh, as an investment proposition uh, r related to ASX. So let's let's talk about what's going on in the cannabis space. Um, that chart there is the um, New Cannabis Ventures Global Cannabis Stock Index. So New Cannabis Ventures has been tracking the cannabis uh, e e sector for the world best part of two decades. And they've constructed this index from various publicly traded cannabis companies. Um, uh, I've talked about this in some of our previous research. Cannabis is a boom or bust industry. When it booms, it booms hard. When it busts, it busts hard. There have been four booms over the last decade. The biggest was 2013 when Canada uh, formalized the regulatory environment for uh, medicinal cannabis and Canadian stocks led the charge in terms of creating this new industry globally. There have been subsequent booms in 2016, 2020 during COVID. And I'm predicting that cannabis 4.0 is coming up, but it's going to have to overcome the bear market that's been in since about 2021. There's the index over the last 12 months, and it's pretty much halved between the start of the year at 14 points and uh, in uh, late August, it got to about seven points. The little spike you can see on the right-hand side of the screen was uh, uh, some short covering. When uh, uh, the um, chatter was in the American scene that the Department of Justice would consider, uh, or a Drug Enforcement Agency would consider downgrading uh, cannabis as part of this general trend towards making it easier for patients to access the legitimate stuff. Um, uh, that, those gains have been have given away. So it's fair to say... My thinking is that cannabis is base building at the moment. At 24, it's got a, a, a decent chance of being in a good year because it's been a few years since the last boom. Interest rates are peaking out and are likely to decline. And some winners are coming through in terms of profitable and rapidly growing companies benefiting from a rise of, a rise of user base. We're seeing that around the world, US, Canada, and now we're starting to see it here in Australia. Actually, Stuart, there was an article in the uh, AFR this morning uh, on, I think, uh, uh, Canada Track. A company that um, that we know quite well, right? Exactly. And, Absolutely. And they started from from zero, and now are up to ninety million dollars in revenues in actually a pretty short period of time. Uh, right. So that sort of goes to show that this sector definitely has legs, even though it's boom and bust. But it's it's definitely got a got tremendous upside if you play your cards right. Right. Big shout out to uh, Tommy Hubert and Brett Schwartz on that one for building a great a great enterprise uh, focused on on uh, quality product at the uh, at the cultivation end and then uh, link that into a pretty solid distribution network um, and benefited from the fact that uh, patients have been knocking themselves out. Let's talk about that in a second. Um, so why are, are, are time set to improve? Um, better companies coming forward, interest rates peaking, um, better regulations around GMP. Uh, Canatrack, the company that Mark was just talking about, has, has uh, focused on that quite strongly. So is Canna South over in New Zealand. Companies are working on GMP, good manufacturing practice where they make their cannabis products like you would make regular pharmaceuticals, uh, they're going to be one of the winners here. The other winners are, are companies with clinical data. Uh, it no longer cuts it just to say that uh, cannabis it makes a great painkiller. What you want to know is that cannabis might act against sleep disorders, for example, or autism spectrum disorders, or Parkinson's, or, 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 or name, you know, name the disease condition. Uh, cannabis is a pretty useful um, molecule, particularly the CBD uh, fractions you can get out of the cannabis plant. Uh, although don't you know don't write off uh, the THC at, at the right uh, right quantities. The point is, double blind placebo controlled trials. We want to know what kind of product this is, how good this is, how good the product is. Is there a safety profile? Ultimately, whether the uh, regulatory agencies will approve the product like they approve the regular um, a regular pharmaceutical. Um, all these characteristics uh, uh, that we we look for in regular pharmaceuticals will be part of cannabis 4.0, and I think that boom is coming. 
um, companies to watch. Um, I've, I've asked uh, Brett Schwartz a few times whether Canatrek will ever go public. Um, and, and basically, yeah, they're doing pretty well privately. Uh, so I'm not sure if we'll see Canatrek as a, as a, as a public company. But there's a whole bunch of, of listed companies uh, in the cannabis space, and I've listed a few of those here. Let me draw your attention to two, which I think are important. Uh, one is ECS Botanics. Um, ECS started out um, as a, a mainly focused on hemp with a number of growers in, in Tasmania. Hemp's uh, more a nutritional product than a, than a, a pharmaceutical. They pivoted into uh, cannabis with the acquisition of Murray Meds uh, several years ago. And now Namari Yashuri and her colleagues are moving this company forward. They're at cash break even now and growing quite strongly. So I think this is one of the leaders of that 4.0 movement that we're, that we're talking about. The other one is Elixinal Wellness. Uh, Mark and I were at a conference in Melbourne just recently with Small Caps presenting, and Ron Dufusi of Elixinal uh, was braving the, um, the, the lectern to talk about his story. Um, he's just uh, locked down a merger with the Sustainable Nutrition Company. He inherited a number of, uh, of, of longstanding brands in that cannabis and hemp space, uh, and, uh, and is now, now, I think, right-sized this company and taking it forward. So we'll do a bit more work on that, that company in, in, uh, in future webinars. But they're two examples of a number of companies that are beginning to, to make their way out of the valley of death and to grow on the other side. But there are others, and you can check out some of them here. Um, now, this chart is interesting. I, uh, this is the chart of Canna South on NZX. Uh, hasn't been a great couple of years for, uh, for, for, for Canna South. Middle of 2023, they completed a merger with a competitor called Egalis. So this is now a fully integrated um, uh, uh, cannabis company based in New Zealand, probably the, 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 um, the, the dominant player in, in that market, with uh, a, a growing uh, suite of products, uh, new generation products coming through, um, uh, links up to uh, the various distribution channels in, in New, Zeal New Zealand, ready to, to start selling in Australia and, and globally. The chart looks terrible, it's fair to say. And uh, I hope uh, Canada South doesn't mind me saying that, um, but that's, that's purely from a, from a sentiment perspective. Uh, business at this company has, has never been better, but this is symptomatic of the kind of bear market we've been going through for cannabis now since, um, uh, since uh, 2021. So still but, just uh, looking at, at catalysts for the turnaround, what would you say are, are the top three catalysts for the sector to come back from to or go back to where it was a few right. times before? Well, um, I think we've just seen a good one for, for Canna South. The company's actually uh, given some revenue guidance about how much they expect to make in, in 2024. They're talking six to 10 million uh, at, at the revenue line and the potential to get towards um, cash break even in late 24. So the willingness of companies to give guidance um, is, is, a, is always a good um, uh, uh, catalyst and, and that, that's here. The second one is, I think, a re-rating of some of the, um, the, the Canadian and US uh, cannabis stocks as well. So keep an eye on that index we were talking about there. If that starts to move, then um, then, then, then Canna South can move with it. So let's talk about why, why investors should put this one on their radar screen. Uh, it's got a decent size. It's 57 million uh, uh, market cap on NZX alone. It's contemplating a dual listing on ASX for next year. The important thing is fully integrated. Uh, they, they actually grow the product in, in, um, uh, in a number of cultivation facilities in, in New Zealand. Uh, and, then, uh, and then process it uh, at a, a plant they've got at Hamilton on the North Island. Strong NZX regulations that were put in place by the uh, Ardern government, governing how you can act as, a, as a, a medicinal cannabis company in New Zealand and how products can get approved. Um, New Zealand market has traditionally been an, an import market where, where product would come from abroad. But those, um, those importers now have to comply with GMP, just like Canada South does. Um, uh, growing patient numbers. Australia and New Zealand, I've been astounded by the number of new patients coming on the, on, on, uh, the market in terms of being able to access um, uh, cannabis medicines. Um, in Australia, this is not the case in New Zealand, but in, in Australia, in the state of Queensland, any uh, general practitioner can prescribe a cannabis, cannabis medicine, whether or not, or not it's an approved product, so long as that, that patient's not on the special access scheme. Uh, so, so basically, uh, you're seeing patients coming forward, so you're seeing strong market growth. Um, uh, and I'm expecting that, that that will continue into 2024. Um, this company is raising some money at the moment, hence the, um, the, the, the briefing we just did over in New Zealand. Um, our research is good background to that. We encourage you to go check it out. And, and keep in mind, this is independent research that was commissioned by Canna South. Uh, they didn't guide us in any way in terms of, of, um, of, of our revenue numbers. Uh, PittStreetResearch.com is the place to find that. So, Mark, that's cannabis. Good stuff. Yeah, quick question, Stu. Um... Not all pot stocks were created equal, right? If you look at uh, kind of track going from zero to 90 million in revenues, that's a massive achievement. 
document. So if you're looking at that list that you had, what are the attributes that you need to look for to pick the high growers in this space? You need uh, links. No pun intended, by the way. Right. You need, <laughs> you need links into a good distribution network. So, so clinicians that are regularly willing to, to prescribe your product, often that comes via telehealth. Um, uh, so, so look for companies that have, that have worked hard on the distribution and equally look hard for companies that are developing their own clinical data, proving that, that their product is useful in whatever disease indications you look at. Once you're comfortable with both those things and there's a pathway towards uh, revenue and ultimately profitability, uh, then, then uh, do the rest of your homework from there. All right. Sounds good. Um, yeah, and there's lo loads of stocks listed on the ASX, so that's a very interesting space. And le let's hope 2024 has got some uh, high times in store for these for these companies. <laughs> Sorry, so I could just go on. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting hungry. The munchies just talking about the sector. Yeah. I got to tell you, <laughs> definitely. Um, all right, so uh, something completely different. Uh, Brainchip. Uh, we won't make it a very long presentation. We've talked about Brainchip for uh, in, in a number of times now. We've talked about uh, what's this about green shoots here, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> well, it should be brown shoots if you compare it to your, your other sector, right? They start out green and then turn brown. Uh, anyway, we're uh, digressing here. Uh, Brainship, we followed that stock for a very long time. We've done research on it with Bit Street Research as well. And in a few webinars this year, we've looked at how the company was tracking. Um, and it's fair to say that we've been critical of uh, the company, as in, you know, what they've been doing on the IR side, for instance. Um, and of course, share price didn't help either. So let's have a quick look at, uh, at the, the, the share price in particular. And there's some, some fundamental uh, developments as well that I think uh, are sort of pointing towards these, these better times through uh, and these green shoots. I think hopefully if they can manage it, um, uh, these, these green shoots should lead to uh, something much more interesting next year and the year after. So let's have a quick look. So Brainchip has been on a downtrend since uh, early 2022, late 21, basically, uh, or early 22, it peaked uh, around the, the Mercedes uh, news. Uh, and, and so I'll go back and uh, look at the, some of uh, some of the announcements, but especially go on social media to see what that was all about, because that's where most of Brainchip's news actually emerges, not so much in ASX announcements. And I think they're looking at that now, actually, to uh, to see if they can do a bit more on ASX announcements in that respect. Um, but it's been on a downtrend since then. And technically, it still is on a downtrend, especially if you look at the moving averages. Uh, it's still not out of the woods yet. But um, uh, and then, of course, yeah, the, the reasons are well uh, documented, like uh, interest rate hikes that have affected tech companies, small caps uh, in particular. Um, so overall, market sentiment has been pretty bad. Um, and I think one of the key things as well has been the lack of commercial announcements. Obviously, any any small cap company with limited to no revenues uh, needs announcements or at least commercial announcements to uh, to make that turn into profitability at some stage. Um, and that means, you know, lack of commercial announcements. Uh, they're still burning cash, right? So that's all. All that combined has led to where we are today. But if you look at the right side of that chart, there's some some things happening there. So let's have a closer look at that. If you look again, look at the right side of the chart here, what you can see there is a double bottom. The first one, the first bottom is 15 cents. The other one just slightly higher, but double bottoms are, are usually uh, or can be an indication of uh, things turning around. And then we also see higher highs in the chart and uh, and higher lows, right? So you see the, the, the spike in, in November was, uh, was again, was higher than the one in October. Um, and the, the bottom that we saw just recently was higher than the previous ones. And yesterday, actually, you can, that's the final bar in this chart. We had another spike up and who knows where that goes in the coming days. Uh, ideally, it closes higher than the, the previous green bar uh, that you see in that chart on the right there. So basically what, what you need is higher highs, higher lows to get out of this slump. But, um, Word of warning, word of uh, a bit, bit of caution here. Uh, if you look at that uh, oval on the left there, we've seen a similar pattern not too long ago. So it doesn't always mean that you're out of the woods, right? Um, you need to be, it needs to be supported by the fundamentals and overall uh, market sentiment should improve as well here. So it's an early indication, but it doesn't mean we're out of the woods just yet. But if we see uh, interest rates come down in the US, that will definitely help next year. And, and the consensus is that interest rates will go down in the US. Um, also, from a fundamental point of view, a, a company has announced a little while ago, or uh, back in March, I think it was the second generation Akita platform. 
Um, but that wasn't un available until I think October. So only since October have prospects and uh, and customers been able to uh, sort of play around with that and and do development work with that. And apparently, um, uh, this is what the CEO told us uh, recently when he was in Sydney, and we did that interview with him. He told us they're getting very good traction with that second generation platform, and hopefully that translates into commercial success uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but of course, it's it's technology. It's uh, basically pre-revenue, although they had some revenues um, uh, last year. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of those were license uh, license fees that they received hasn't translated yet into recurring revenues. So um, it's technically not pre-revenue, but uh, you know you know what I mean here. It's um, it's not sustainable at this uh, rate yet. So they need more commercial deals for that. But the company is burning four million dollars uh, U.S. Uh, per quarter, and with uh, just over sixteen million left in the bank, uh, basically you've got four quarters of runway, which means that there needs to be some some cap capital raise event. Now, Brainship has got to deal with LDA Capital, uh, where uh, the deal is they can get uh, issue shares to LDA, and uh, in return, of course, for for cash. Um, but there's issues with that structure because it's expensive and it is pretty dilutive and LDA Capital to hedge his own book uh, is pretty keen to sell those shares as soon as they can, right? To, to manage their risk. So I think that has contributed to the share price decline. Um, in the very short term, it is a source of money. So I don't think Brainchip will run out of cash, but uh, ideally Brainchip changes the structure, gets rid of it uh, and, and, and set up and sets up some more so a structure that's more beneficial to existing shareholders so not with a, a group that is incentivized to sell as quickly as possible which lda clearly is so that's the, those are the key risks for for brainship <clears throat> but i think from a fundamental point of view uh for the company specifically but also higher level for the market in general with interest rates hopefully coming down in the us next year um and from a technical point of view it looks like there are some green shoots now uh of course, um, we only give general advice, uh, as, as people will know, but uh, especially with stocks like this, they're pretty high risk, uh, as is basically the entire uh, small cap market in Australia. So be mindful of that. Um, needs to fit within, within your own risk parameters. Uh, and especially for the, for the semiconductor development stocks, uh, I think the risks are even higher because they all depend on getting these commercial deals in. Uh, and there are so many factors that are uh, at play there. And we've seen this with, with other uh, semiconductor stocks as well, where um, it, it's just, you know, anything can happen really and, and push a deal out. So be careful with this one. But I think looking at where it's, it's come from and looking at the market cap, I think Brainship could be interesting at this point in time because it seems that things are turning, although very slightly, slowly, but this, things seem to be turning. So, Stuart, uh, that was it for today. So we had weed and we had semiconductors. Anything that you'd like to add in this uh, still risky market? Well, we just want to squelch some rumors. There, there's been rumors that uh, the new d uh, government in the Netherlands has reached out to Mark to, to uh, include him in their cabinet. And he said, look, there's more opportunities in small cap stocks in Australia than there is serving in the government of the Netherlands. So, Mark, you're not going to be a, a, a cabinet minister in Gert Wilder's new government, right? No, I was very, um, uh, very honored to be uh, to be asked, um, not for the migration portfolio, but for <laughs> for the technology portfolio. Uh, no, but I'll, I'll stay right here. Although with the weather today, actually with the weather today, yesterday, I feel right at home uh, because it's as crappy as the weather in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'll stay right here. I'll just wait for you, Stuart, to uh, when you win the elections in Australia and set up your uh, your Liberal government. I'll I'll come by for a cabinet post at that time. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, stay bullish, everyone. Let's talk next week.